Welcome. In this chapter, we'll be talking about whole numbers, and particularly, we'll be studying the operations on whole numbers, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. Now, I know these are topics that you've probably been exposed to before. You have probably already added, subtracted, multiplied, and divided whole numbers. But I encourage you not to skip over this chapter. In fact, I encourage you to, to try to look at the math involved, look at the discussion in a somewhat different way than you did before. In, in, in fact, I, I, I would like not only for you to know how to work math, but I want you to know how math works. And this is a perfect time for us to learn about that kind of process. It, the process is, is this, that as math gets more and more complicated, it's important to uh, understand the general idea involved in a process rather than memorizing how to work the process. You see, if you know the general idea, then you can apply that idea to a much broader group of problems. And in fact, these general ideas that are learned right here in arithmetic apply to higher math. It's just that we apply those general ideas to more complicated problems. So if we know the general idea, then we can work some uh, remarkably complicated uh, problems a, a little bit later. Well, we're going to start here with the notion of whole numbers, as I mentioned. And whole numbers are listed here. Now, notice that these are just zero, and, and we're just counting up the, our number system. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. The dot, dot, dot means and so on in the pattern that has been established. So there are an infinite number of whole numbers. This pattern just continues forevermore. Often, whole numbers are illustrated using a number line. Here's a number line, and the various whole numbers are just illustrated as positions along the number line. A number line is, is nothing more than a ruler. It can be thought of like a ruler. And the numbers, then, are just telling us a distance from zero. You see here, we're one unit away from zero. For three, we're three units away from zero, and that kind of thing. Now that is just one way to interpret the number line, but it's a pretty good way for us to make the interpretation at this point. Now when we locate a number on a number line, like let's say that we want to locate seven. Oh well, here's seven. And if we uh, make a dot at seven, we are constructing the graph of seven, you see, with the dot. And uh, this seven is, is telling us that we are seven units from zero along the number line. Number lines are real handy in describing the relative position uh, of numbers and whether numbers are greater or less than one another. You see the relative size of numbers. Now numbers, be because of the nature of the number line, as the numbers get bigger, bigger, bigger in this direction, numbers that are to the right of other numbers are greater than the numbers that are to the left. That is, 9 is greater than 5 because it lies to the right of 5 on the number line. And it kind of makes sense from the standpoint of distance as well. 9 is a larger di distance, you see, than 5 is. You see, that's a way of, of looking at it. Well, let's see, if numbers that are to the right of other numbers are greater than those other numbers, that is, 9 is greater than 5, on the other hand, 5 can be said to be less than 9 because 5 lies to the left of 9 on the number line. So we have this relationship on the number line that gives us an order relationship between the numbers. Now, here's how we write a, the order relationship. We know that on the number line, 3 lies to the left of 5. We're comparing 3 and 5 now. So we say that 3 is less than 5. And the notation for is less than is this little arrowhead looking affair. And this is read 3 is less than 5. If we want to write that 7 is greater than 2, and we know that's the case because 7 lies to the right of 2 on the number line. But to say this mathematically, we use this symbol. 7 is greater than 2. I want you to notice here in both of these that the little arrowhead tends to point toward the smaller of the two numbers. That is, here's 3, here's 5, the arrowhead kind of, the arrow points toward the little one. And here with 7 and 2, the arrow points toward the little one. You see, and a lot of times if you forget which way the arrow goes and which one means less than, which one means greater than, then what you can do is just write a couple of numbers down that you know the relative size of. Like, that is, if we, we think about, oh, well, let's just put 1 and 5 up here. 
Well, we know that one is less than five. Now, make the arrow point toward the small one and read it as you understand it. I understand that one is less than five. Oh, this means less than is less than. Okay, so that's the idea. Now, let's talk about the relationship between these pairs of numbers. Now, think about 32 and 12. We want to uh, write the, the symbol for less than or greater than that's appropriate for the pairs of numbers. Now, there are a couple of ways of doing this. One way is to say, well, which one is smaller? Well, 12 is smaller than 32 and just make the arrow point toward 12. You see, that's, that's one way. Another way is to say, well, gee, where do these two numbers lie on the number line? Well, 32 lies farther to the right on the number line than 12 does. So that means that 32 is greater than 12. Now compare 41 and 48. You see, again, we could say, which one is smaller? Well, 41 is smaller than 48, and make the little arrowhead point toward the 41, and we're writing the correct relationship. That is, 41 is less than 48. And once again, 48 lies to the right of 41. 41 lies to the left of 48 on the number line. So 41, then, is less than 48. Whole numbers are formed using digits, and there are 10 of them. I'm sure you've seen these before. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Those are our 10 digits, and those digits are useful in forming numbers. Now, when the digits are arranged in a particular pattern, for example, a pattern maybe like this, then we have a number. Now, notice that there are five digits being used here. It's customary in situations like this when uh, five or more digits are used that a comma be placed in a position where there are three uh, digits to the right of the comma. And we'll have more to say about the uh, use of the comma and what it means and, and so forth in just a little bit. But at any rate, each of these digits, uh, because of its placement, has a certain value. And we want to talk about that place value here. The 2 is said to be in the 1's position. And uh, so that is its digit value. The uh, neighbor, the 6, it has a value which is 10 times the 1's digit. 10 times 1 would be 10. So the 6 is in the 10's place. The neighbor to the left of the 6, the 4, has a value which is 10 times the 10's digit. 10 times 10 is 100, so the 4 is in the 100's position, or is the 100's digit. 10 times 100 would be 1,000, so the 7 is in the 1,000's place. 10 times 1,000 is 10,000, so the 3 is in the 10,000's place. Now, each place value... Uh, and along with the digit in that place value gives rise to or contributes to the value of the overall number. For example, if we take a 3 that is in the 10,000's position, that means 3 times 10,000 or 30,000. That is its contribution to the overall value of the number. The 7 in the 1,000's position means 7 times 1,000 or 7,000. 4 in the 100's position means 4 times 100 or 400. A 6 in the 10's position means 6 times 10 or 60. And a 2 in the 1's position means 2 times 1 or 2. So each digit is contributing a certain value to the overall number. And we, when we add all of those values, we get the number that we have before. That is 37,462. Let's talk about uh, digit value a little bit more and, and the use of the commas. Now, I've just put little dashes, uh, little kind of underlines uh, here uh, for the various digits uh, right to left. And notice the separation. Every three digits has a separator uh, with a comma. And um, uh, all the way across from right to left. Now, here are the values for all of those digits. Now, each group of three, uh, each group of three digits, that is each of these groups is called a period. These are periods. Each one is called a period. And each period has a name. The name for each period corresponds with the word uh, that is at the right of each particular period. For example, the period at the right is called the ones period. And the word, you see the place value at the right of the period is the ones place. 
In the next period, the word for the place value at the right is thousands, and the word thousands appears in every name within that period. So this is the thousands period. In the next period, we have the word millions. This is the millions period. And in the period to the left, it's the billions period. And incidentally, the pattern continues on and on forevermore. Uh, we only have two digits listed here for the billions period, but there is a third uh, digit, and its value is, let's see, the last one we have listed is 10 billions. 10 times 10 would be 100, so it would be the 100 billions place, you see. And then another period would follow to the left and so on. But let's talk about how these, these periods contribute to the naming of a number. It turns out that to name a number, to write the name for this number, uh, we say the number that is in a period, and then we name the period. Uh, in naming a number, and we start with the leftmost period that is in use here. So here we have the leftmost most period is the thousands period. So what we say is the, the number 37 and the period name is thousands. So we say or write 37,000 and then we say and write uh, the number in the next period. Now for the ones period we don't really generally write ones, you see, the period name. We do for all of the others. So this number would be written as 37,462. Now I'm, I'm using a comma in the name of the number just in the same place as I use the comma in the number written with digits. And this is a kind of an optional thing. You don't find that uh, all the time in your textbook. but. Uh, it is not incorrect to do this, and it kind of helps us to keep track of where we are in the number. Let's take another number. This one is much larger. We'll start with the leftmost uh, period that's in use. This is the billions period. So we name the number, and then we uh, use the name of the period. So if the number is five, the period is billion. So we say this is five billion, and then we slide our thinking over to the next period, Name the numbers, 256, and then the period name is million. So we say 256 million, and then we slide our thinking over a little bit more. We're in the thousands period. We name the number 483, and then we attach the period name thousand. So 483,000, and then we slide on over to the ones period, and we simply say 791. Now, I have written each period name on a separate line here for emphasis, but uh, generally we probably wouldn't do that. Uh, this would just be strung out uh, in, a, in a more of a sentence kind of form. Well, the idea of periods uh, and the period names and so forth can be used to actually write a number that we have written in words. You see, we have the, the number written in words. Now we want to write the digits in their proper place associated with these words. We have 609,948. Now notice that there is no comma involved in the problem, uh, but no matter, we will uh, go through and first identify the period that is used here, the very first or highest period that's used. And that period is the thousands period. Now what digits will go in that thousands period? Well, it turns out that the the digits will correspond to the number preceding the period name. So we have 609 in the thousands period, and then we and we write that down. And then we proceed to the number that is in the next period. It turns out to be 948. So we write 948. Consider this somewhat more imposing uh, number, and uh, notice we don't have uh, the, the place values here for us to go by. We just start with 35 million, 52,000, and so on. Now we identify first the leftmost period that we're talking about. It's the millions period. And we write the number within that period. So we write 35 in the millions period. Now, there are no uh, placements for the period here. We know that eventually we're going to have a thousands period and a ones period, but we generally just don't write these blanks. We just follow up with writing numbers. And the next thing we look for is the next period name, and that's the thousands period. The number in the thousands period is 52. So we write 52 in the thousands period and then another comma. Now, notice the zero uh, here. We uh, 
you put the zero in because we know there are three digits within every period. And uh, if we just put a five, two, and a comma, we would only have two digits. So we need that zero in here to hold that position. There are no uh, hundreds within the thousands period. That is, there, there are no uh, hundred thousands involved in this number. So we need the zero to hold the position. And the next thing we do is follow up with the number that is in the next period. It's the ones period, and that number is 407. So we write 407. Now suppose we change the number just a little bit. Now watch the change. Instead of having million, suppose this word is billion. We would start in much the same way. That is, we would say, okay, I'd like to identify the first period to the left that we're talking about. We're talking about the billions period. Okay, and what's the number in the billions period? It's 35. So we write 35 in the billions period. Now we know we want numbers for the mil we need a millions period, a thousands period, and a ones period to follow this billions period. Well, as we look at our number in its written form, the next period that's named is thousands. So we completely skipped over the millions, and it doesn't tell us we don't have any millions, but we don't. There are no millions that are mentioned here. So we have to have placeholders for all of the digits that are in the millions period. We write zeros for all of the items in the millions period. And then we proceed as we normally would. We would write 52 in the thousands period and then 407 in the ones period to finish off the problem. Suppose we go to a football game or a baseball game and let's say it's a playoff game and the stadium is filled with people. And suppose after the game we wonder how many people attended this game. Uh, we might read in the paper the next day the exact number. But just as a loose reference or just as a comparison with the number of people at other games, would we want to know the exact number? You see, at a football game there might be 83,000 people. You see, at another football game there might be 62,000 people, you know, something like that. But do we want to know if it's 62,147 or something like that? Or is 62,000 close enough for us for our reference to the attendance at a particular game? Well, certainly the, the numbers of thousands is probably all we would be interested in. If we were thinking about the distance from the Earth to the Sun, we, want, we don't want some particular number of miles. It would be okay to just say, well, it's about 93 million miles. You see, that's a, that's a pretty good approximation for our purposes. So sometimes we want to take a number, which is a particular number, like the exact number of people at a, at a ball game, let's say, and we want to write that number to the nearest thousand, let's say. You see, we want to approximate the value to a certain particular digit. And in that case, it would be the thousands digit. Let's talk about that idea. How do we go about that rounding process? Now, suppose we want to round 52 to the nearest 10. Well, here I have a number line that contains multiples of 10. You see, I have 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and so on. Now, Rounding 52 to the nearest 10 simply means identifying which of these 10s this number 52 is closest to. Well, let's identify the position of 52. 52 is, well, here's 50, 51, 52. So it's right here. And it looks like, gee, it's closer to 50 than it is to 60. It's between those two, but it's closer to this 10 than it is to that 10. So to the nearest 10, 52, is 50, you see, rounded to the nearest 10. In a similar way, if we want to round 38 to the nearest 10, 38, well, let's identify the position of 38. Here's 30, here's 40. 38 would be, oh, roughly right about in this neighborhood. You see, right about here. And looks like it's closer to 40 than it is to 30, and therefore we say to the nearest 10, 38 is 40. All right. When we have rounding to do, we could certainly make a number line like this, and we could actually visually see the, the nearest 10, you see, to the number that we have on the number line. But there must be another way to do that, and that's what we want to talk about here. Here's what I want to show you, though, that if we, if we look at, uh, here's 50, that would be 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, and so on. Now, think about the ones digit 
you see in the numbers that are in this neighborhood. Those ones digits for 51, 52, 53, and 54, those the ones digits are one, two, three, four. You see, and over here, when we're on the 60 side of things, you see, when we're closer to 60, the ones digit would be six, seven, eight, nine. You see, and the, the ones digit of five is right in between. For 55, that ones digit of five puts us right smack in between 50 and 60. And we simply decide that when we're right in between, we go to the next one. Okay, that's what we're going to decide on. So our decision about rounding is made according to the digits that we have, you see, that, uh, that, that follow the one that we're trying to round to. We're trying to round to tens here. Well, we look at the ones digit in order to decide where we round. Here's how that process works. Suppose we want to round 52. Now, we're starting with the numbers that we had earlier, but here's the process that we go through. If we're rounding to the nearest 10, then you want to underline the number that you're rounding to. And you want to look at the neighbor to the right. All right, now that would be the ones digit here. And if that digit is one, two, three, four, you just drop it off and make it a zero. You see, and just write this as 50. Just drop it off, and make it a zero. All right, so that's the idea. If that ones digit, on the other hand, is five, six, seven, eight, or nine, then you want to drop it off, but you want to make the tens digit one bigger. And that's what we have to do here. When we round this number off to the nearest ten, here's the number we're rounding to, the tens digit. We look at the neighbor to the right. It is five or bigger than five, you see, and therefore we make this digit one larger and make that a zero. So this is 40 to the nearest ten. Same idea here. To the nearest ten, Here's the tens digit. We don't really care about this digit. It's just tagging along. We're just going to bring it over in just a second. But we're rounding to that digit. We look at the neighbor to the right. We look at the four. Oh, it's less than five. So we're going to just drop it off. So we'll write four, seven, zero to the nearest ten. 685. We're rounding off to the nearest ten. Look at the digit to the right. It is five or bigger than five. So, we're going to make this one digit larger and make that a zero. So this will be six, nine, zero. To the nearest ten, look at the next digit over. It's five or bigger than five, so we're going to make this one larger and then make that a zero. So three, four, three, zero. Notice that the three and the four here, those digits just tag along. They just come right on over. They don't play a role really in the process in this particular problem. Suppose we want to round these numbers to the nearest hundred, to the nearest hundred. Well, again, we identify the digit that we're rounding to. The hundreds digit is the eight. And we look at the neighbor to the right. We don't care about this nine. We only care about the two. You see, we only care about this ten digit. So, rounding off to the nearest hundred, identify the number you're rounding to, look at the neighbor only, and that neighbor is less than five, so we're just going to lop it off. You see, and we'll have 800 then as the nearest hundred. Now, if you think about this on a number line, if we're rounding off to the nearest hundred, then we would have hundreds marked off. 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, and so on. Now, to the nearest hundred, you see, this 829 is nearer to 800 than it is to 900, and that's why we round in this way. All right, so that's the general idea. You can always visualize it in that other way. Think about it on a number line as easily as you can, uh, perhaps going through this little process. All right, rounding this one to the nearest hundred. Here's the hundreds digit. We look at the next digit over. It's five or bigger than five, so we're going to make this one larger. So this is 500 then to the nearest hundred. For this one, now we have to be a little careful. Here's the hundreds digit. We look at the neighbor to the right. It is five or bigger than five. We want to make this one bigger. Make nine one bigger. Whoa, it's ten then. And that one and the ten we carry over here, you see, and this becomes actually four thousand. Now let's think about that for a little bit. We're rounding to the nearest hundred. Now this number, th 3,962. We can think of this in terms of hundreds 
This is between 3,900 and 4,000. You see, here's the number that's 4,000. You see, 4,000, 3,900, 62 is between 3,900 and 4,000. But it's closer to 4,000, 4,000, than it is to 3,900. That's the idea. Rounding this to the nearest, these numbers to the nearest thousand, we identify the thousands digit. Look at the digit to the right, it's five or bigger than five. So we're going to make this thousands digit one bigger and put zeros as placeholders for those other digits. For this one, the thousands digit is the five. We look at the number just to the right of five, it's one. So we just lock these off, make them zeros. We have 25,000 for the number which is to the nearest thousand to this one.